humbly accept the word that has been implanted within you, the scripture says. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You guys can have a seat. Generation loss is the uh, steady diminishing of quality that happens anytime you make a copy of something. You know, a copy is never as good as the original. Nothing's as good as an original. So when you make a copy, some of the details of what you're copying get lost in transfer. And so the more copies you make, when you make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of something else, sooner or later that generation loss becomes so overwhelming that you can barely read what it is that you wanted to copy uh, to begin with. In John chapter 16, Jesus is spending the last night that he's going to have on earth with the disciples before he goes to the cross. And what he tells them over the course of a lot of chapters is that things are about to change for them. That the way that Jesus teaches and the way that Jesus guides them through their life is about to change uh, forever. He says in John chapter 16 and verse 6, he says, None of you is going to ask me where I'm headed because you're too upset. You're grieving that I'm going. But I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Because unless I go, the advocate, the Holy Spirit can't come upon you, can't uh, implant within your lungs. Skipping ahead to verse 12, he says, I have so much more to teach you. I've got more than you can bear uh, at this point in your life and your discipleship journey. But I tell you that when the advocate comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to slowly, steadily, and surely guide you into all truth. You know, the truth is that Christ Jesus is just as present with us today as once he was with the disciples. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 that our bodies, ourselves, the core of our being is the temple of God, that the Holy Spirit makes his home with us. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. The Apostle Paul talks about walking in the Spirit, walking along with the Spirit everywhere that we go. Not just something that we get filled with once, but at this, it's this constant filling of the Spirit that takes us through not just Sunday, but through every day of our week. He stays with us day in and day out. And again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3, Paul says, nobody can say that Jesus is Lord. Nobody can come into the house of God unless they're drawn by the Spirit himself. So the fact that you're here this morning, the fact that you got up out of bed and that you found your way into a house of prayer, what that tells us is that the Holy Spirit is at work within your life, within your mind, and within your body, drawing you to love him, drawing you to know him, leading you and guiding you every step of your way, guiding you into, as Jesus says, all the truth that there is. Not as, not as a blueprint, not as though there's some ideal way to live out your Christianity and we're all copies of copies of copies of that blueprint. Some of us are walking that journey better than others, whatever that means. Now what Jesus says is that you are an individual called by the grace of God and our our journey and our walk is not about trying to be the best copy of a copy of a copy of somebody else, but that you are to grow by the work of the Holy Spirit continually working within you to be the best, the most spiritual, the most connected, the fullest version of your individual self that you can be. Jesus says, I have more to teach you than you can handle. 
more to teach you than we can bear in one lifetime. And so over a course of that lifetime, the Holy Spirit living within ourselves continues to guide us day by day into whatever truth is going to call you to be the fullest version of yourself you can be, that indwelling of the Spirit. It means a couple of things for us today. If you've got your sermon notes, we're going to pick up right here uh, with the first one. What that indwelling of the Spirit means in our life is that God created you. God has created you to be one of a kind. God has created you uniquely. And that ongoing work of the Holy Spirit has created you to be a unique and individual creation of Almighty God. Psalm 193 says it this way, I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. The psalmist says, you formed me in the womb before I was born. You constructed me in the secret places in the depths of the earth to become and to be who it is that you've called me to be. You knew me, he says. Before I was born, who I was going to become was already mapped out. You already loved me. You already knew me. Not as a series of labels, by the way, that other people uh, put on you. The way we compare ourselves to other people who bear those same labels, labels, but as a unique and individual creation of God. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 15, God says, I called you by my grace, by your name, before you were born. I knew you, and I put my name on you, and I called you to be my child. You know, I keep this copy of uh, my favorite painting in the world. This is Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son. Can you see this? This has been hanging in my office for as long as I can remember. And it's not, it's not a, a great print. There's a little generation loss in here because it's not, uh, obviously it's not the original. It's a copy of a copy of a photograph of another copy of a print that somebody took at one point uh, that cost me $6 on Amazon.com. And what you can't see in this print that you can see in the original is that there's another figure back here in the corner. There's another person uh, over the father's shoulder. I had a friend of mine, it's on the front of your sermon notes if you want to take a look at it. I had a friend of mine who went to see the original at a hermitage in St. Petersburg a couple of months ago. And he took a, a picture of the original print and he had it printed up for me. It's a little small, so I couldn't uh, hold it up here for you this morning. But what you can see in the original that you can't see in the print is that the figure standing over here in the corner over the father's shoulder is the prodigal's mother. She's standing, uh, I can imagine, wondering if his return is for real or being overjoyed that her son has come back to her one way or the another. You know, I just, I never noticed her because I've been staring at a print for too long. You know, you can do that with an original. You can compare a print with an original painting and see what's different about them, see which one is quote, better, whatever that means. You can do that with two copies of the same painting. You can compare the original to a print, but you can't compare, for example, two paintings that are supposed to be different to begin with. Again, you can compare a print of Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son to the original Return of the Prodigal Son, but what you can't do is compare that painting with like his self-portrait. You would never do that because they're supposed to be two different things. They were constructed to be two different things. One's not better than another. One's not less fulfilling than another. They're intended to be different paintings who evoke different emotions. And yet how tempting it is for us as individual creations of God to compare ourselves with other individual creations of God. And that leads me to the second thing I want to share with you this morning. If number one is that you have been created one of a kind, that God has created you to be one of a kind, then number two is God is creating you to be one of a kind. 
You are God's ongoing creation and through the work of the Holy Spirit that is working on you right now in this moment and every day of your life, God is creating you to be unique. Isaiah 43 in verse two, the prophet says, though you walk through the fire, you won't get burned. And when you walk through the water, he says, not if, by the way, not if your life doesn't turn out exactly how you planned it, but when your life doesn't turn out exactly like you planned it, I will still be with you, God says. You know, Jesus in John chapter 20, after he was raised from the dead, this is the resurrected Christ. Jesus, in the fullest imagination of his resurrected glory, when he comes and he stands in the upper room with the disciples two weeks in a row, you notice the same thing about Jesus, the perfected and resurrected Jesus still bears the wounds of the cross. They're not scars, by the way. You can't put your hand into a scar. You can't put your hand into the scar that a spear makes. These are still wounds to Jesus. He still bears the wounds of the cross. And I'm going to say this to all of you guys uh, this morning, but particularly uh, to those of you who are mothers, who are grandmothers, who are raising children, who want to be raising children, some of you this morning are carrying unique wounds that are brought to you by your one-of-a-kind children. Some of you guys this morning may know what it is to bear the wound of losing a mother. Some of you this morning may know the wound of losing motherhood. And what Jesus says to each of you in this sacred space, when he says to you, I have much more to teach, much more than you can bear in one sitting. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you over a lifetime into all truth. What that means is when our life doesn't turn out the way that we had planned it, you know, when we know what it is to be wounded, either through miscarriage or for the loss of a grandparent or not knowing what it is to be a mother and wanting so deeply to have that life experience. What Jesus says to us is that I am still creating you every day of your life. You know, Martin Luther said it this way, and I love it when he talks like this. He said, I know that I'm not what I ought to be but I'm also not what I used to be. And I'm also not who by God's grace I will become. Y'all this morning, I'm gonna say this and then we're gonna close in prayer. There's nobody to compare yourself to. There's nobody who has the same life experience that you do. There's nobody for you to stand next to as a blueprint and decide whether you're a copy of a copy of a copy of something else with whatever generation loss you feel insufficient. You know, nobody, nobody posts pictures of themselves covered in food stains and crying in a corner on Instagram. <laughs> All of those comparisons that we hold in our hearts what Jesus says to us today is we can let those melt off of us because you're not a copy of a copy of a copy of someone else. You are the only fearfully and wonderfully made one of you that there is. The creator of heaven and earth and the one who called the universe into being created you individually and knew you before you were born. He called you by name. He set you apart and called you by grace to be his own, to be his beloved son, his beloved daughter. You're the only one of you that there is. There's nobody to compare yourself to. God loves you. He loves you as you are, and he loves you as he is creating you to be. Let's pray.